I just, if this goggle was 350 bucks, it would be incredibly, incredibly compelling. If it was 370 bucks, it would still be pretty compelling. But for 440 bucks, I'm Joshua Bardwell, and you're going to learn something today. The Elmay Commander V1 was a pretty solid budget FPV goggle. So when Elmway announced that they were coming out with a Commander V2, and it had basically the same optical specs, field of view and resolution, as the vaunted Fat Shark HD3, I got pretty excited. But when a company like Elmway tries to sell a goggle for $440, it had better be pretty freaking good. Is it? Let's find out. Here is the Aomai Commander V2. And if you're familiar with the Commander V1, it's not that different. You got a diversity receiver, diversity 5 gigahertz FPV receiver. Over on this side, we've got a head tracker and fan button. And this is a head tracker bay if you're a fixed wing pilot, probably. Um, quad pilots don't tend to really fly fix, fly a head tracker very much. Uh, there's a DVR button to control the DVR. That's pretty intuitive to use. There is a channel and band button. We'll talk more about that in a minute. Uh, and this is the mode switch, which is also used to navigate the internal menu. The mode switch is used to change from AV input to RF input to HDMI input. And yes, there is an HDMI input here on the underside. Now that HDMI input can take both 720p and 1080p input. The screens are only 800 by 600 resolution, so don't expect to do any reading of eBooks. The, 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 the resolution will get downsampled. But if you want to do something like play a simulator or even watch a movie, yeah, you, you could do it. 1080 input as well. A lot of other goggles only do 720 input. That's why that's worth mentioning. Here on the underside are the IPD sliders and the goggles have an IPD range of 59 to 72 millimeters. This is worth noting because some other goggles on the market only go to 69 millimeters. So if your eyes are just a little too wide, these goggles may suit you. The 59 millimeters is pretty standard. So if your eyes are just a little too narrow for other goggles, these aren't probably aren't going to do it. And the IPD sliders, they're not ratcheted but they do have some friction and they seem to do an okay job of holding position mm, it, when you like put them in a bag or something like that. Here is where the fan is located and the fan pulls air through the goggles. Uh, it's especially useful on a very humid day, especially if you've come from air conditioning out into the humidity. Uh, running the fan can help clear the goggles of fog. The fan is activated via a press on this button. It is not an on off switch like some other goggles. So if you prefer to just like on some other goggles with a switch, you can just put the switch in the on position. The fan just always runs when you're, when you're using the goggles and that's that. This is not like that. This is more of a fat track style where you have to push the button to activate the fan each time you want to use it. The SD card for the DVR goes in here and it is easy to insert and remove. Uh, unlike like on, some, on the Fat Shark style goggles where you got to stick it in here and it's kind of hard to get your finger in. Very easy to get in and out. However, the DVR is, uh, it's basically just like the Fat Shark DVR. It's the same DVR that you've got in so many other modules uh, with the standard D1 resolution and low bit rate. And uh, so no nothing revolutionary here with the DVR, but nothing particularly worse than anybody else either. In order to give you a better idea of what the experience of looking in these goggles is like and show you how the menu works and so forth, I've got my GoPro out and I'm holding it in the goggles. I'm, it's going to be a little bit fiddly to do, but I'm going to do my best. So you change channels by pressing the channel and band button and you can press channel one time to move through the channels within a given band. And you can see there in the OSD, it shows up and shows you what channel you're on. If you want to switch bands, you hold the button down for three seconds to switch to the next band. And that's a little tedious, okay, to, to be honest, because there's a lot of bands it supports. It supports like not just the main four bands, but also like G band and D band and so on. And so this is a pretty tedious way of doing it. And I honestly don't recommend it. The other way to do it is to go into the menu, which... There, so you hold down this joystick here to get into the menu. And then from the menu, you can very easily switch bands and switch channels. And you can see it's updated on the screen as you do it. So you can easily scan through here, look for it. One of the things that really frustrated me about using this is if you're scanning through the bands and you accidentally go all the way to the right, 
it enters scan mode and there's no way to break out of that that I could see once you get into it. So you're like, oh, what band do I want to be in? Oh, 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 no, I'm scanning now. And you basically you have to power cycle the goggles to interrupt it as far as I can tell. You can see in the menu that there's various other things you can do, such as change the brightness and contrast and change the, uh, the, uh, the RF receiver from left antenna to right antenna or even turn it off if you want to use an external AV input. And one of the things that makes or breaks a goggle like this is the ease of use. And the most fundamental thing you have to be able to do with these goggles is get them onto the channel of the transmitter that you want to watch. Now, there is an auto search function, but auto search has always been kind of hit or miss. For example, you can end up on 5806 instead of 5800 and you'll kind of see the signal, but your range will be crap. So I really never trust auto search. And auto search works best when it's implemented, like, for example, in the Furious FPV True D, like the spectator mode that you see some goggles have, where they'll search and they'll find all the channels that people seem to be on and just show them to you in a set. And you can flip between them and find the one with the best signal strength. Or you can say, OK, this guy's on race one and that guy's on race six. I'm going to go watch him. In a case like this, where the goggle will just search and find the strongest signal and then stop, that's not really that useful. Even if, I was going to say, unless maybe like you're the only one flying and then you get it onto your channel. But again, what if it doesn't quite get onto your channel? It gets onto an adjacent one and isn't quite right and then your range is crappy. So I always set the channel manually. Uh, I never trust auto search. And setting the channel manually here, there's no indication, number one, of what the signal strength is on the channel. So what I'll do with my LaForge, for example, is I'll scan through the channels and I'll look for the one with the strongest signal and I'll stop there. But here, yeah, it's it's not, it doesn't show you the signal strength, so you can't really know which one is stronger if you've got two close by channels. The other thing that this goggle does that's really confusing is that the the, the, the channels, they seem to be like completely wrong. All I know is I was out flying and I knew I was on whatever Fat Shark 4 5800. But when I actually went to F4 in the Aomway Commander, I wasn't on the right channel. And it was a lot of struggling to figure out, well, I don't know what they're doing here. So now looking at this table, I can see that it looks like for the Aomway, they're calling the Fat Shark band D band 5740, 60, 80, 800. Yeah. So I don't know. It's the F band, or sometimes it's called, I think, the A for airwave. But so they're calling it the D band. Okay, fine. And then we've got race band, which is 5658, 5695, 5732, which they're calling E band, which is confusing because E band is actually a thing. And 57 C band, 5725, what that's sometimes some places call race band C band, 5725. I don't. And then here's A band 5865. I don't even see that. E band 5705. What the hell? Oh my, pardon my pardon my swearing, but oh my, what the hell? What do you I don't even I don't even. So it seems like the bands are mostly there. They're just not labeled the way like everyone else labels them and I have no idea why you would do that. Now, I said earlier that the specs on these goggles were very, very good. 45 degree field of view is a really great sweet spot for a big image, but without it being so big that it kind of, you have to kind of feel like you're looking around the goggles. The optical quality on these goggles isn't bad. I wouldn't say that the screens and the, the sort of lenses are on the level of like looking into a Fat Shark HD3. HD3 is better, but there's not any like massive deal breakers. It really depends on what you consider to be a massive deal breaker because for some people, even the Fat Shark HD threes have a little bit of blurry edges and, and they find that, uh, they find that distracting. I should hang on. I hope that this shows the image quality of the two compared to each other. Uh, the HD three to me has a much better much better image. And in fact, the HG3 is also filling the screen more with the same amount of zoom. I can just barely fit it on the GoPro screen. Um, the other thing I was going to show you is that you say, oh, well, the commander has an on-screen display, so you can adjust it with the goggle on your face. But so does LaForge V4. So yeah, you can do whatever you need to do. There you go. 
So there is a sample of the image from the HD3 screen for comparison. And here's the commander. And uh, hey, this is Joshua from the future here. When I was looking at this in editing, the first time I saw the footage from the commander, I said, wow, a GoPro really made it look like the image was bowed in at the edges. And I don't remember it looking like that when I put my face in the goggle. Uh, but now seeing it side by side with the HD3, um, this is exactly the same settings on the GoPro. And the HD3 does not look like that. So I've gone back to look at the Commander again, and it's not as, it doesn't seem as prominent as this when you've got your face in there, but I gotta say, it, it, it does kind of look, this is what I'm talking about when I say that the optical quality of the Commander is just not quite there compared to the HD3. The final thing to consider then is the build quality of the goggles. And I will say, uh, first of all, Commander V1s have a great track record. They've been out long enough that they've had the chance to fail catastrophically or have some defect, and they haven't done it. The build quality of the Commander V1s has been pretty solid. So I think we can expect the build quality of the Commander V2s to be solid, barring any surprises, Fat Shark with your HDOs with the line at the bottom of the screen. But the build quality is still not quite as good as it could be. For example, if you look at the IPD measurements here, one of the things I noticed is that this one, oh wait, did you see that? Watch. When I push this one over, watch what this one does. Yeah, they, they actually can't go all the way in. And I'm actually gonna measure and see what the, what the IPD is because are they actually achieving the 59 millimeter IPD that they're advertised? But then that means these slots are just not cut right to, to stop. And you can actually continue to push the lenses together. And if you do that really hard, one of the screens will turn white and stop displaying image. And that doesn't seem good. So I would rather the goggle not let me do that. <laughs> Mostly though, the build quality is, seems pretty solid. Let's just measure the IPD. How am I going to do that? Oh, my handy dandy caliper here. Try not to scratch these screens while I'm... So yeah, if I measure the width from edge to edge, it looks like the closest they can actually get together is 63 millimeters. They can't seem to get all the way in to achieve the full 59 millimeters that they're rated for. At least not on my goggles. There's some obstruction in the optical module and they just won't go any further in. So it looks like 63 millimeters is the IPD for my goggles. That's, a lot of people are gonna have trouble with that. So then let's sum up these goggles and try to answer the question, should you buy them? The optical quality is decent. The screens are decent. The specs are great. The DVR is not great, but about as good or bad as anybody else. The build quality is okay. But for example, this little issue that I'm having with the IPD, is that just me or is that everybody? I don't know. I wish that wasn't happening. The usability could be better. What's going on with the channels? But you'll, you'll figure out the channel band and, and you'll get used to that. But just the, the basic function of changing channels is a little bit confusing. The real, the real sticking point with these goggles though is the price. $440. Wow. And when you consider that you can get a Fat Shark HD3 core for $399. Okay, so it doesn't come with a module. Yeah, you're right about that. Oh, and these also come with antennas. They come with antennas. Are they good antennas? I don't know, but they come with antennas too. So, okay. So let's take the Fat Shark HD3 core for 400 bucks and you add in a module like, let's say, a real ACC or maybe an Ishim Pro 58, which will give you a great experience with the Achilles firmware. So let's say $30 for a module. So now we're at basically price parity. There's no way I would tell you to buy this instead. The HD3 is a spectacularly good goggle. The downside of the HD3 has been, you no, know, you still don't have an on off switch. Uh, the fan is integrated into the goggle. That's nice. But just, just the, the, the experience of using for me, the experience of using that external module, especially if it has the OSD like the LaForge or even the Pro 58, the Achilles can do that too. Especially if it has the built-in, uh, that to me is just a better experience. It's a better built goggle. You would have Fat Shark support, of course. Um, 
I just, if this goggle was 350 bucks, it would be incredibly, incredibly compelling. If it was 370 bucks, it would still be pretty compelling. But for 440 bucks, I really feel like Amway has priced themselves out here. Frankly, you, you, at 440 bucks for this goggle, you almost, some of you are going to start thinking, God, I could spend 60 bucks more and get a Fat Shark HDO. 60 bucks is a lot of money, but when you're spending 400, 500 bucks, hey, maybe it's, it's not that. Anyway, so I think this is an okay goggle. And if it appeals to you, I don't think there are any deal breakers here except the IPD. Just definitely, if you have a very narrow IPD, you may have trouble with this. Although I have a very narrow IPD and I was able to use it. it maybe it wasn't quite as centered as it should have been, but there's no deal breakers here. But at the same time, it's not just an instant buy at a price of $440. Not for me anyway. That's going to do it for this review. But what many of you guys are wondering is, what about this? Yeah, I've got the Eoshin EV200 as well. And it is only 279 bucks. But hang on. There's more. This may still be the better goggle. Thanks for watching. Happy flying.